Hi, I'm Josh. Welcome to Mountain Roots. This is part two of Who Are the Appalachian People from my Exploring Appalachia series. Although stereotypes, caricatures, and yellow journalism have sought to belittle and downright mock the people of this region, it possesses one of the richest English heritages in the entire English-speaking world. As I've shared before, Appalachia has an ancient and unique history. The earliest Appalachians weren't white Europeans, but rather an early people living here thousands of years ago. And they also weren't Native Americans. But if not Native Americans, who were they? They were a civilization that even predated today's Native Americans. And until recently, we knew little to nothing about them. Yes, you heard me correctly. Recent genetic and archaeological research in the last decade now shows that today's Native Americans arrived from Central Asia in the 300 to 800 AD range. They were resettling the Americas well before Columbus did, but they by no means were the first people here. What we thought we once knew about ancient American history is being rewritten. As you may have seen in Graham Hancock's recent Netflix documentary, Ancient Apocalypse. By the time Columbus arrived in 1492, some estimates, like Charles Mann writes in his book 1491, show that Native American populations in the Americas were upwards of 50 to 100 million people, which is comparable to global populations in Africa at the time with nearly 45 million people and Europe with nearly 80 million people. But by the time of the early 1800s, Native Americans were undergoing massive population collapse, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent collapse. Native American oral histories like the Red River Delaware record also point to this. The mysterious Melungeon people of Appalachia may have been the mixed descendants of early Native Americans and the pre-Native American people of the older civilization that predated them. Some of the earliest Americans were the Olmecs in 600 BC in Central America near the Gulf of Mexico. Appalachia derives its name from a Native American people known as the Appalachi from the Appalachi province on the Gulf side of the Florida Panhandle. Later conquistador expeditions north would eventually designate the entire mountainous region as Appalachia. And when the British Empire established its 13 colonies extending from Georgia to Maine, the Appalachian Mountains served as the western borderland for the settlements. Looking back at the early scholars of this era, there were a lot of horrible stereotypes given to native and indigenous people, viewing them essentially as dangerous subhuman savages. Tragically, we can reference the removal acts like the Trail of Tears that physically expelled people from their ancestral lands based solely on them being indigenous or non-European. Entire communities were eradicated because of genocide and relocation, in addition to the seismic population collapse I mentioned a moment ago. And sadly, not even half of 1% of the Appalachian population today is descended from what we once thought of as the original Native Americans, such as the Cherokee with the exception of western counties in North Carolina, where the percentage is anywhere from 6 to 27 percent. It must be clearly acknowledged that the roots of Appalachia, however bloodstained they may be, are rooted in indigenous people and the mystery people who predated them. More information is forthcoming as advances in genetics research and archaeological technology upends what was once held as the official view of human history. I'm excited as gatekeepers are questioned by inquiring minds and a new and more accurate view of our human past and our Appalachian history emerges. Appalachia is really the story of immigrants. And it would only be Native Americans and sparsely peppered European trappers and mountain men who inhabited these western lands of Appalachia for well over a century before waves of European migration began to occur. The mountains served as a buffer or a hedge for the newly developed English colonies from the often hostile Native American tribes as well as the French and Spanish. Today nearly 85% of this region is of European descent with a much higher representation and concentration of this ethnicity compared to the rest of the United States. Yet to simply paint the region with the broad stroke of white history robs it of its nuance and complexity. 
In a nation obsessed with ethnicity and race, today's America has a gaping hole in its understanding of its own origins. For example, the Scots-Irish, or Scotch-Irish, overwhelmed the English and German ethnic groups throughout Appalachia in the South and the Ohio Valley. As Alexis de Tocqueville described in 1835, the Scots-Irish had nothing in common with either the New England Protestant groups or the original English settlers and aristocracy of Virginia. They were distinctly separate and different peoples in almost every way. From this, a unique regional Appalachian cultural identity began to develop as the larger number of Scots-Irish immigrants were later joined by other migrants of European descent, Anglo-Americans from the East Coast and Germans who were very prominent in Pennsylvania. And after generations lived, intermarried and settled here, instead of identifying as their country of origin because hyphens weren't important to them, many considered themselves native Appalachians or simply American. Another reason for the extraordinarily high percentage of the U.S. population having some degree of ancestry from this region is that as civilization pushed westward, it passed through places like the Cumberland Gap. Later, many would also move to larger East Coast cities like Baltimore and New York, seeking employment and opportunities during the Great Depression and afterwards. Although Appalachia was indeed at one time the rugged western frontier, this idea that it was the Wild West with violent feuding families simply isn't factual. Sure, there were some feuds as I've covered in previous episodes, but many of these are grossly exaggerated by media and sensationalized by Hollywood. Guns were certainly functional tools for hunting and providing, as well as for self-defense, and policing also operated differently due to the remoteness of Appalachia at the time. Eventually, the war between the states would fracture some communities, as seen in small towns with family-related power dynamics like the Hatfields and McCoys. And despite racial stereotypes, the vast majority of Appalachians did not own or support slavery, and in fact many viewed the institution with hostility due to a number of factors. Not only this, but Appalachia includes Africans, black communities that by 1860 made up over 10% of the Appalachian population, and in later decades, more than 20% of the mining labor force in West Virginia. Some have used the term Afrolachian to recapture this black history, such as the Nugoni influence coming from throughout Africa and Egypt. Sadly, many early historians eradicated black history from Appalachia in textbooks. Blacks and Appalachians have strong connections in that they've both been exploited for commercial gain over the course of history. One particularly egregious example of this is the hillbilly stereotype. To many, this region of the United States is the home of the Appalachian hillbilly, portrayed as a gruesome group of people known for personifying all that is uncouth and unpleasant in American society. The hillbilly stereotype is a harmful, exaggerated image created by individuals, sociologists, the federal government, and media over the past 175 years or so for their own gain, leading to the forced eviction of hardworking Appalachian mountain people and entire communities from their multi-generational lands and homes, such as the federal government's push at the turn of the 20th century to establish a series of national parks in the eastern United States like the Great Smoky Mountains and the Skyland area of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains and the reservoirs of the Tennessee Valley Authority. The presence of these mountain people presented an obstacle to be removed, inevitably by force and yellow journalism. You see, the idea of peaceful people being forced off their land, it didn't provide great political optics, nor did it sit well with the conscience of the American public. So, the colluded effort began by portraying these folks as uncivilized and needing rescue through industrial development. The media perpetuated this image of them as uneducated and uncivilized, mere barbarians and beasts of burden, needing salvation from their wretched station in life. Government officials held this paternalistic attitude towards them, and Franklin D. Roosevelt even implied the federal government had the right to seize their lands since they weren't being used for the highest good. In this context... It's quite obvious why Appalachia is also seen as economically backwards. But in actuality, some remarkable things were occurring in Appalachia over the decades. 
The idea that it's backwards is a flawed perspective. Appalachia was producing enormous resources, but it has received a grossly unequal return on that investment to all the extraction industries like timber, coal, and even human labor capital. Deindustrialization and post-extractive economic decline has hit Appalachia differently than other regions since there aren't other jobs and opportunities readily available to turn to. In a sense, much of Appalachia has seen a reverse of the Great Migration to Appalachia. We've seen a great exodus in light of post-industry decline. Again, this is disproportionately high in central Appalachia, leading to concentrated poverty and pockets of limited economic opportunities in West Virginia and Kentucky, who've been hit the hardest by these intersecting geopolitical forces. Think about it. Extraction was so prolific at one point, it literally took an act of Congress in 1911 to create the idea of public land in order to protect timber stands. Later, this would ultimately give us national forests. Unfortunately, under the guise of the means justify the ends for the greater good, many places throughout Appalachia were simply set aside as sacrificial zones. These areas have seen farms, cemeteries, and entire communities flooded in order to provide hydroelectric power like in the 1960s, as well as mountaintop removal in later years, along with its polluting ash and waste retention ponds. All of this arising from absentee landowners, the nameless, faceless corporations that claim rights to the minerals and natural resources, yet externalize the cost to others and to the environment. Appalachians hold a unique and rich history, as well as face unique challenges. But for those whose roots run deep here, they aren't giving up. This is their story to tell. I know there's incredible interest in the work I'm doing. If you want to also support and help keep me on the road producing this series, there are several ways you can help. Watching, commenting on, and sharing the episodes is always a great starting place. You can also become a channel member on YouTube for as little as a dollar a month. There's also the Super Thanks option on YouTube beneath any video that you watch so that you can donate as much as you like. Facebook has also started a similar feature to the Super Thanks called Stars. A hundred stars equals a dollar and can be donated on videos you watch there. You can also become a monthly patron on Patreon. I have a variety of membership levels set up there. And starting now for the new year, I have a new Riding Shotgun membership level for only $2.99 a month. I do my best to provide extra perks to those who are able to support me financially as channel members or patrons. Thanks again for all your interest and support in Appalachia. It's many incredible places, fascinating people, and their remarkable stories. This is all something I think is worth sharing. Mm -hmm.